Uh, we hope that is coming uh, shortly. We now recognize Representative Raskin for his uh, testimony. Chairman Jordan, uh, Ranking Member Plaskett, dear colleagues, our framers were Enlightenment thinkers who wrote us an Enlightenment Constitution. They wanted government to operate on the basis of facts, science, and common sense, not ignorance and superstition. They wanted America to usher in an age of reason. With the separation of powers, the framers constitutionalized Newton's third law of motion, checking every action with an equal and opposite reaction. And Congress in Article I was given the central role of legislating and making progress for our people. The oversight function is not specified in Article I, but the Supreme Court has always said that it's implied something necessary and proper for the legislative function. As Madison famously said, those who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. Dear colleagues, your subcommittee could conceivably become part of a proud history of serious bipartisan oversight stretching from the Teapot Dome investigation to the Boeing investigation, to the Watergate hearings, to the tobacco hearings, to the select committee on the January 6th attack. Or it could take oversight down a very dark alley filled with conspiracy theories and disinformation, a place where facts are the enemy and partisan destruction is the overriding goal. Millions of Americans already fear that weaponization is the right name for this special subcommittee not because weaponization of the government is its target, but because weaponization of the government is its purpose. What's in a name? Well, everything is here. The odd name of the weaponization subcommittee constitutes a case of pure psychological projection. When former President Donald Trump and his followers accuse you of doing something, they're usually telling you exactly what their own plans are. By establishing a select subcommittee on weaponization, they're telling us that Donald Trump's followers, who obviously control the subcommittee, will continue weaponizing any part of the government they can get their hands on to attack their enemies, defined as anyone who stands in the way of their quest for power. To be clear, that's not an exclusively partisan operation. They've proven that they will weaponize the government not just against the other party, but against anyone who refuses to bend to the will and whim of one Donald Trump, whether that's a lifelong Republican state election official, like Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a foreign head of state, like President Zelensky, a political movement, like Black Lives Matter, a once close personal friend and ally of Trump's, like his personal lawyer Michael Cohen for many years, or even a sycophantic Trump cabinet appointee and lifelong Republican like Attorney General William Barr, if these people break from the habits of lying and lawlessness that define life as a camp follower in the cult of Donald Trump. But if the weaponized MAGA campaign isn't exactly partisan, it is entirely political because it's got an overriding electoral focus and you know what it is. It's all about restoring Donald Trump the twice impeached former president to the office he lost by 7 million votes in 2020 and tried to steal back in a political coup and violent insurrection against our constitutional order on January 6, 2021. You disagree? Well, please don't take my word for it, as our chairman might say. Just listen to what Chairman Jordan himself had to say six months ago at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Dallas, where he was predicting GOP victory in the 22 elections and promising that oversight of Hunter Biden's laptop and the claim that the federal government is treating moms and dads like the ones in this room like terrorists would be the centerpiece of the GOP's work in the House when they got it back into power. Relaxing with a friendly interviewer, Chairman Jordan gave the game away entirely. Quote, all those things need to be investigated just so you have the truth, he said. Plus, that will help frame up the 2024 race, when I hope and I think President Trump is going to run and we need to make sure that he wins. We need to make sure that he wins. 
This call to arms for the 2024 presidential election was met with wild applause from the CPAC audience. I urge every member of this subcommittee to go and watch the interview. Now, of course, a serious bipartisan committee focused on weaponization of the government would zero in quickly on the Trump administration itself, which brought weaponization to frightening new levels across the board. Consider just a few examples I have time for, illustrative of dozens I can provide the subcommittee. One, in a six-week period in 2020, Donald Trump fired or removed five different departmental inspectors general simply for doing their jobs and not caving into Trump's coercive political demands to cover up different forms of administration wrongdoing and misconduct. April 3rd, 2020, Trump informed Congress he was firing Intelligence Community Inspector General Michael Atkinson, who had received a whistleblower complaint in August 2019 about improper demands made by Trump to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. In May 2020, Trump fired Steve Linick, IG of the State Department, later claiming he had no idea who he was and saying that he fired him only at Secretary Pompeo's request. That inspector general was investigating Pompeo's decision to bypass Congress in sending billions of dollars in arms to Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't have time to get into the details of the others, but May 20, he fired Mitch Bem, the transportation uh, deputy IG. Uh, he relieved of duty Glenn Fine, acting uh, IG for the Defense Department. He removed Christy Grimm, the acting inspector general of HHS. Second, breaching the traditional separation between the president and Department of Justice criminal prosecutions, Trump and his obliging sycophantic attorney generals like Jefferson Sessions and William Barr repeatedly pressured career prosecutors to go hard or go soft in particular cases, always seeking to reward Trump's friends or to punish his enemies. If weaponization of the Department of Justice has any meaning, this is it. Consider the egregious case of Gregory Craig, a White House counsel under Obama, who was targeted by the DOJ for alleged FARA violations and finally indicted on a single count of making false statements. He was acquitted unanimously by the jury in less than five hours, and one of his lawyers observed that the Department of Justice had hounded his client without any evidence and without any purpose. Former U.S. Attorney Je uh, Jeffrey Berman said that Greg Craig never should have been prosecuted. Consider the case of Michael Cohen, the president's former lawyer and confidant for many years. In August 2018, he pleaded guilty to campaign finance violations over large hush money payments he arranged before the 2016 election to keep porn star Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal from talking about sexual affairs they had with Donald Trump. You guys remember this one. Well, after Barr became attorney general in February of 2019, he worked to kill further investigations related to those payoffs and suggested that Mr. Cohen's conviction on campaign finance charges itself be reversed, even though six months had already passed since Cohen had entered a guilty plea. Amazingly, after Cohen was in prison for a year and then being transferred out of prison to home confinement during COVID-19, Barr and the DOJ intervened to block his transfer because Cohen would not immediately accept as a condition of his ankle bracelet home confinement not to engage in First Amendment activities, specifically writing and publishing a book about Donald Trump or saying anything in public on TV or in the social media about Donald Trump. Cohen had already been home for two weeks when this unconstitutional demand from DOJ appeared, and when he and his attorney dared to ask questions about it, three federal marshals showed up with handcuffs and shackles, and he was returned to the Otisville Correctional Institute. There he spent 16 days in solitary confinement before they were able to get his case before a federal district judge who immediately found that Barr's purpose, quote, in transferring Cohen from release on furlough and home confinement back to custody was retaliatory in response to Cohen desiring to exercise his First Amendment rights to publish a book critical of the president and to discuss the book on social media. Can you think of a more egregious example of weaponizing the Department of Justice for nakedly political purposes than imprisoning and putting in solitary confinement the president's own former lawyer simply because he wanted to exercise his First Amendment rights. Consider the John Durham investigation 
At the urging of Republicans, including the good chairman, the John Durham special counsel investigation was set up in 2019 by Barr to try to find wrongdoing by intelligence or law enforcement agencies in the origins of the Mueller investigation. And we've heard some of the murmurings about this today. After four years and millions of dollars spent, the Durham investigation closed as a total flop without unearthing anything like the deep state conspiracy that Republicans have been denouncing around here for years. It couldn't find anything of substance to it. Yet Barr and Durham kept pressing in clearly abusive ways. I hope your subcommittee will investigate. One former DOJ prosecutor, Robert Luskin, a defense lawyer who represented two witnesses before the Durham probe, told the New York Times he was shocked. This stuff had my head spinning, he said. What did these guys, when did these guys drink the Kool-Aid and who served it to them? Amazingly, when prosecutors participating in this wild goose chase actually came into possession of evidence of a real offense from Italian government officials of a potentially major financial crime committed by Donald Trump, Dunham, Durham was suddenly deputized to investigate it and the whole investigation mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Trump's enablers now want this subcommittee not to examine the, Dunham, uh, the Durham debacle as a case study in dangerous weaponization of the justice function, but rather to pick up the baton from the defeated and demoralized Dun Durham team and to keep the wild goose chase going today. Third, the former president had no qualms about literally weaponizing our nation's law enforcement and military against First Amendment activity for his political purposes. I commend to you the debacle that took place on June 1st, 2020 in Lafayette Square, where they mobilized an interagency law enforcement um, uh, troop and then unleashed them on horseback with pepper spray uh, and batons, um, billy clubs, rubber bullets against a totally a lawfully present crowd. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that any of the investigations that have taken place during the last two years have been perfect. I'm sure they could have been improved in some ways. That's a legit thing for you to ask. But it's one thing to engage in systematic oversight driven by a commitment to facts and the truth and something radically different to set up a platform for a series of hit and run partisan attacks that are just vindictive, vendetta driven and meant to frame up a presidential campaign in 2024. And some of the new rhetoric we've been hearing can be dangerous, as the ranking member was pointing out. After the execution of a perfectly lawful judicial search warrant in Palm Beach in August of last year, politicians and media figures began denouncing the FBI, the whole FBI and FBI agents in vitriolic terms. And since then, the FBI and DHS have observed an increase in violent threats posted on social media against federal officials and facilities, including a threat to place a dirty bomb in front of FBI headquarters and issuing general calls for civil war and armed rebellion. And we've heard those calls before in this chamber. On August 11th last year, a person wearing a technical vest and armed with an AR-style rifle and nail gun attempted to forcibly enter the FBI Cincinnati field office. When officers responded, he fled the scene and a pursuit followed. During a prolonged standoff with the FBI, the man fired multiple shots at Ohio State Highway Patrol. Mr. Chairman, the public is skeptical about this strange new venture with the strange new name that's being launched because so many of the members involved have done everything they can to block the January 6th committee's investigation of the worst insurrectionary domestic violent attack on an American election in the American Congress in our history. And the public wonders whether members who refuse to comply with congressional subpoenas themselves should be issuing congressional subpoenas to other people. Oversight must be organized around a comprehensive search for the truth, truth that will lead to progress and not around revenge, which will lead us as a country to chaos and ruin. I hope the subcommittee will find a way to embark upon a truly bipartisan agenda with all members participating and agreeing on a common agenda. And I wish you well and Godspeed on behalf of this dif dif difficult venture that you are about to proceed on. I thank the gentleman. I can assure the gentleman from Maryland that we will, uh, we respect the FBI agents, uh, particularly the ones who have come to us, the dozens who have come to us, and we will focus on the facts 
something I felt was uh, not exactly presented in the proper way.